Today we're critiquing viewer submissions, and as we listen to this music, I want you guys to be thinking very carefully about what you would do to improve upon the music that you hear. I do not pretend to have any of the answers, but we're gonna do our best job at figuring out just how to get good at music. With that in mind, let's listen very carefully to the Mache Koshal Trio. How might they get good at music? I don't know, it sounds pretty good already. <laughs> yeah. Like kind of surf rock, kind of. I like that hit, that rhythmic hit there. Hmm, nice. Killing. Very Phrygian. <laughs> Another rhythmic hit. Vibes. All right. Very, very cool. Make sure to write down your critique before I get to what I have to say about this band. But I really liked it. It's a really nice surf rock trio kind of thing. I like the rhythmic hits that you guys are playing. I like just the general tones you were getting. But if I had to give you a critique, there's actually two things that I think could be improved upon. The first thing is dynamics. So the big thing with dynamics, how loud and how soft the music is, is that the perception of the performer is often very different from the perception of the audience. What you, the performer, think is loud and what you, the performer, think is soft is often very different from how that comes across. So, and I've said this before, it's very important to exaggerate dynamics. Make your louds super loud, make your quiets super quiet. This goes for literally everything you play. If you think you're playing loud, play it louder. If you think you're playing soft, play it softer. So check out the snare hit right here. That was like going from kind of soft to kind of loud, but it could be so much more dramatic. When you embody that kind of drama in the dynamics, it's so much fun as a performer. So I would encourage you to really embrace the extremes of loud and quiet. The second critique for this music is that the way that the guitar player and the bass player are moving doesn't seem like it's really in sync with the music. It seems like you guys are just kind of like wobbling back and forth and you don't have a very defined center of gravity at any given moment. I used to be very guilty of this kind of diversionary movement in performing. This is a clip from about 10 years ago where I'm kind of like wobbling back and forth. And this kind of like teeter-totter movement when you're moving that's not really in time with the music can actually have a negative impact on your rhythm. I did a video a couple years ago on the importance of balancing when performing. And basically what I was suggesting is that practicing single leg balance can actually improve your rhythm overall because you get a better sense of your center of gravity. There's some really interesting research on the importance of the vestibular system, the system in the inner ear which governs balance, and how messing with the vestibular system can actually influence your perception of rhythm and meter. So if you're not rock solid with your balance, you won't be rock solid with your rhythm. And this doesn't mean that you can't dance around because of course dancers have excellent balance. But one thing that I recommend doing is actually getting very low. And that lower center of gravity will help get you more connected, more grounded, and feeling closer to the music that you're making. Like actually a useful way of thinking about this is like squaring up with somebody to box, except you're playing an instrument. You have your feet very firmly planted on the ground, but you're also loose and mobile so you can react to things. It's like, yeah, all right. I'm here. It's time to battle. In other words, power stances. I love a good power stance. Anyway, this next one comes from Ori Angel, AKA Shork. <laughs> That's cool. It's in seven. It's a nice loop. Charming. I love it. <laughs> okay, okay. I like the percussion sound. It's, it's really nice. Wow, I love that idea. Like, what a great vibe to be making, like, a lo-fi beat with this loop of a ping-pong ball. It, it just, it's, mm, mwah. But of course, we're trying to figure out how to make this better. 
And I think the big thing here is that you lose the 7-4 at some point. You have this really nice harmonic rhythm going on in the beginning, where you start on an F sharp minor chord on the first beat, you go to an A chord on the third beat, and then you anticipate the fifth beat with a D chord. And it sounds really nice as a loop, but at a certain point as you're improvising, you lose that loop. So the chords are not hitting where we're expecting because I think you just weren't super comfortable with 7-4. As a listener, that's kind of unnerving, and I think it's important whenever you're improvising in odd time signatures to keep repeating the same pattern over and over again so that we know where we are, because of course, repetition legitimizes. important to keep repeating that and not lose your place in the improvisation and always be counting in the back of your head one two three four five six seven eventually you will get it to the point where you can be more fluid with your improv but for right now keep it very very steady because that I think would really take this music to the next level The next one comes from Ruel Williams, who I met on the street the other day. <laughs> cool, man. All right, let's check this out. Some nice percussion. Cool. Some of those background textures are really nice. Yeah, I love that combo of electric bass and piano. Woo! <laughs> That's a cool melody. It's a nice repetitive melody. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> XLR cable percussion. Woo, okay. Yeah, this is awesome. Wow, I, I love the bass line. The vibe was just so, so cool. But of course, we're trying to figure out ways of improving this. So what could be done here? Well, what I think this is, is a fantastic introduction to a piece of music. We're building tension by adding different layers. We got that melody coming in, we got that awesome bass line, but we never really feel like we arrive anywhere. I know you're working within the limitations of a 60 second TikTok video, and I totally get that. But what you could do for like five seconds, drop out all the elements that you have, the bass line, the piano, the percussion, and then have something like a sample or like, some crazy melody or, or something contrasting the cool groove you got. That way there's like a narrative, there's drama, like you have all this stuff happening and then boom! Repetition legitimizes. And then you go back to this cool vibe. That back and forth can really add some life to the music, especially since you don't have the benefit of playing this music live with other musicians where the improvisation and the little fills will go a long way of keeping the same groove feeling interesting for a long period of time. So yeah, for me this groove needs just like a little nugget of something else to highlight how cool what you have already is. Anyway, let's keep going. This one is from Quick the Band. Mario Kart vibes, yeah. It's very busy. Hey! <laughs> Just got hit with a bass solo. Hate it when that happens. <laughs> Wow, unison. <laughs> very cool, very energetic. I dig that vibe. But I have two critiques here, and they play off of one another. The first one is that the mix is doing you no favors here whatsoever. It is a very muddy mix. The lead bass part is getting buried by the lower bass part and the keys, and it just creates this very chaotic, muddy feel. This is compounded by the fact that the bass 
and the drums are just playing too busy for what's needed in this particular musical situation. Think about what's needed for building a building, right? You need a foundation, and that foundation can come from either the drums or the bass, or ideally both. But if both the drummer and the bass player aren't showing up for work at the construction site to build that foundation, then the whole building is going to collapse. So don't get me wrong, it's a lot of fun to play a lot of notes in these fusion contexts, but your patterns as bass player and drummer have to interlock in some meaningful way. If you listen to classic fusion recordings like Light as a Feather by Chick Corea, Stanley Clark and Lenny White are very much locked together in the same pattern. They're playing a lot of notes, it's exciting, but they're keeping it steady. Anyway, let's check out the next one, which comes from Brinesley. Fortunately, she's playing a guitar, but we won't hold it against her. Truly the inferior instrument. <clears throat> I love that. <laughs> Not taking it too seriously, that's great. Repeating a line. Repetition legitimizes y'all. Nice. <laughs> okay. I, I love that. Uh, obviously, there's a false start that happened in there, but there's something I think that's pretty important to be learned here, and that is if you make a mistake, it's okay. It's just music. Keep going. If you have a sense of humor about it, the audience will too. That's something that everybody needs to learn, myself included. I can get so upset at myself for making a mistake and upset at other people for making a mistake or perceived mistake. And professionals do this all the time, and it, it's just, it's... It's just music. So in terms of stagecraft, this is great. This is fantastic and exactly what you need to do. Laugh off the mistake, it's just music. Now in terms of melodic stuff, you had a great idea to repeat a melody and develop a melody that you had. It sounds like you need to practice your scales though. Big thing for you as you go on your musical journey is to not hunt and peck for the notes, but know where the notes are based upon the muscle memory that you develop playing scales on your instrument. Of course, that's a lot of practice, but as a general rule of thumb, the chord quality that sounds like home goes with the scale that you might use with the melodies that you play. So if you have a D minor chord that sounds like the tonic, chances are D minor pentatonic or D minor would go with the full progression. General rule of thumb, there are lots of exceptions to that. Anyway, let's keep going. This next one comes from Tyler Bridgewater. Hello, my dear. Nice. Found you walking around my head again. I like I like your voice, man. I've been thinking it's probably best to separate. That's nice. I hope I find courage to say. Nice progression, yeah. So this is really nice, Tyler. I, I really like the song. I really like your guitar playing, nice tone. Your vocal tone is great. But I think the same ideas that I had about the first band and balance will apply here as well. You're kind of doing this swaying motion. It doesn't seem like you have a really strong center of gravity. You don't seem super grounded as you're playing. And as a result, I think your guitar playing isn't quite as rhythmically tight as it could be. So if you really plant yourself low and engage your core and get a low center of gravity, your vestibular system will become more balanced and then in theory, your guitar playing will become more balanced as well. It's just a way for both the audience and the performer to feel more comfortable with the music because it doesn't seem like you're super comfortable just standing there and playing guitar right now. And this is a way of making your life easier, quite frankly. And it's such a simple thing, just like low power stance. It goes a long way. Next one comes from Sergio Alonso.
Nice counterpoint, like intermoving melodies. Very slick. That's a chord. Mm. More chords, wow. Ooh, a lot of that diminished harmony, augmented harmony. Like that. Well, awesome. Great job. I love this song. This is Panonica by Thelonious Monk, which was written for uh, the Baroness Panonica de Konigswerther, who is a famous patron of jazz musicians and a close personal friend of Thelonious Monk. It's a great tune. You took this tune in some really interesting harmonic places, and I thought it was very melodic and a very beautiful arrangement. But what I was kind of missing is the rhythmic intensity and the rhythmic drive of Thelonious Monk's music. You know, Thelonious Monk is known for weird dissonances, but to me, his music is first and foremost, rhythmically grounded, it's blues-based music, it's dance music, and that's definitely the case on even ballads like Panonica. Now I know this is just a solo jazz guitar arrangement, but even still, you can really play with the dynamics like we were talking about earlier to add some more rhythmic intensity here. Like for example, this line. What if it was like ba da ka da ba da ba ah ah? Kind of ridiculous, obviously, when I'm scatting it, but adding that level of like in there, I think would take it to the next level, or at least bring it closer to the Thelonious Monk that I know and love, which is very much about the rhythm. Beyond that, man, this was a fantastic arrangement, a really beautiful one, so thank you so much for sharing. All right, so this next one comes from Raphael Jama. Immediate vibe. Mm. This is really nice, guys. I love it. Like that key bass. Love it. I love it. Great job, guys. That was such a such a vibe. It really goes to show you like what you can do with just two chords and a nice simple melody and a nice groove. I mean, that's you know what music's all about. Fantastic job. There's not a whole lot I would critique here, but I think you could take some of these things to the next level with some more detailed vocal production. Like with this style of singing, I'd imagine you could get away with recording a lot closer to the microphone and take advantage of that proximity effect, which makes things feel like very close to your face. The Billie Eilish effect, right? Where she's singing very quietly and it sounds like she's inside your head. And even if you didn't do that, I bet you'd get a lot of mileage of compressing the hell out of these vocals so that they feel very present and very close because I think that's kind of the vibe for what you guys are going for here. Also, key bass is fine. I don't wanna knock key bass because I think key bass can be pretty cool, but electric bass, I think, would take this uh, production to the next level. Getting some nice like P bass tone in there would be like, mwah, the vibe. I just like playing along to your groove, guys. It's an awesome groove. Anyway, let's do one more. This one comes from Cody Lee. All right, Trent. The one true musical genre. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> All right, very cool. I like the vibe. I like that guitar lick that you're playing throughout, but I have a question for you. Are you hearing that guitar lead as the melody or are you just hearing it as like a background element? Because to me, it sounds like it should be the melody, but you're treating it in the mix as if it's supposed to be in the background. See, for most styles of music as like a composer or a producer or arranger or whatever, I'm always thinking about foreground elements versus background elements. The foreground is what the audience is listening to and mainly paying attention to, and the background elements are aiming to support that. When you're mixing, and honestly, when you're composing too, it's important to always be thinking that. What is the most important thing? What should the person be paying attention to second to second? Because it might change. If you don't have that clear idea about what's in the foreground, it's hard to make mix decisions. And so you get a mix where it's not quite as clear as to what we should be paying attention to at any given time. Obviously, since we're watching you play a guitar and a video, that's mainly what we're paying attention to, but that's not really what's coming out in our auditory experience. So the moral of the story, and I really, really hate to say this, is uh, I, I think you could turn the guitar up in the mix. Uh, that's probably the only time you're ever going to hear me say that, but uh, yes, more guitar, please. <laughs>